right, I think we can get going. It is about 10.02, so we've got lots to go through today. Okay, so today we'll be talking about big data analysis and how to reduce test flakiness. But I'm sure you want to know who you are speaking with. So first of all, uh, my name is Adam, Adam Salmon, and I'll be the, one of the presenters today. Uh, you can read here my bio. I've been doing some coding and various things since I was 10, so a total uber geek. And uh, currently, I, I'm the director of technology here at Inflectra, and we're a software project requirements and test management company. And I love technology, business, innovation, all of that good stuff. And our co-presenter is Dennis. Denise, if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm working in test automation for more than 10 years. So not sure that this number 18 years is correct. So it <laughs> grows up very <laughs> rapidly. So uh, I'm currently a principal software engineer at Inflectra and uh, I'm one of the creators of Rupees test uh, automation tool. So that's it for the introduction. Excellent. So now you know who we are. Uh, let's talk about what we're going to be talking about today. So the goal today is to talk about test automation. And I'm sure everyone on this call uh, hopefully is familiar with the idea of test automation. Uh, we want to get computers to do more of the testing. Uh, with Agile, we have to test things more rapidly. Every sprint, the continuous integration and continuous deployment, we may be pushing code into production uh, ever faster. So unless we can automate testing, testing can't keep up. However, test automation seems to be a very hard problem to solve, uh, and why is that? And uh, so to do that, we did a research project to try to understand uh, why is test automation, uh, particularly web, web applications, that's the focus for today, why is that such a hard problem to solve uh, when you think it might not be? Uh, we're going to go through that research project, what some of the findings were, and then I'll be handing over to Denise, who will be talking about some of the things we can do to improve test automation and make your tests uh, less flaky, less error-prone, and more reliable, and therefore improve the return on investment you get from test automation. So really, it began with a question. The whole project began, and we've started this project a few years ago, and it's been running for a while, and it began really with this simple question. Uh, why is test automation so difficult and unreliable? And you might be thinking, well, is it? Well, I go, we go to a lot of testing conferences, and over the years, it seemed like everyone wants to do test automation. Everyone is doing test automation, and everyone is failing at test automation. Um, it seems to be a very difficult problem to solve, and, and, and it seems to be the, the unreliability aspect of it is the big problem. So what we realize is, let's look at the world and see you know, what, what does the internet look like? And, and just to go back one second, when I say test automation, uh, if you look at a lot of the test automation industry, originally you know, people were testing uh, desktop applications, applications, uh, you know, Windows, Java apps, they were testing tools built to do that. And then we moved to the internet, to the web, and obviously have mobile apps. We do seem, that seem to see that test automation, particularly at web apps, seems more difficult. Um, when you look at people testing desktop applications uh, or mobile applications where you have, I think, tools that create the apps, and, and without getting too much into the findings, we find that the test automation challenge with web seems to be a very difficult proposition, more difficult than desktop apps, mobile apps, and other applications that we may have come across. So that's why we decided it made sense to do a project and look at websites in general. Let's get a large-scale data analysis of websites that people are using uh, for business or for other purposes, and let's see uh, how easy it would be to test them if we were doing test automation across the internet. And you might be saying, what's Moz 500? So the Moz 500 is something that if you work in search engine optimization or digital marketing or um, anything in those areas, you'll be very familiar with Moz. Moz is actually the leading tool for uh, ranking websites and for search engine optimization. If you're going to make your website uh, be found by Google and rank well, you will use a tool like Moz to actually improve the, the website. And so what Moz does is it ranks from 1 to 500, the most popular by internet searches, 500 most popular websites in the world. And if you look at the list, this is a list from I think a year or so ago, uh, no surprise really, Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, WordPress, Pinterest, Wikipedia, uh, and WordPress.com are the biggest, most visited sites, the top 10 most visited uh, domains, at least in the world. And you can also look at it by pages. And if you take not just the first top 10, but the first top 500, you've got a good cross sampling of popular, highly used uh, websites. These are probably websites with good budgets. The development team 
are probably using the latest technologies like React, which was invented by Facebook, or Angular, which is invented by Google. Um, and they, they've got these in good technologies and good techniques. So these websites should be well written. They should have the latest technologies. They should have good coding practices. They probably have to be accessible for people who have disabilities. So they should have good metadata. And you would think that this would be a really good and easy set of websites to test versus some application that you have to test. Maybe it's an in-house banking application that a small team is building under time pressure and taking some shortcuts. So this is a really good example. If we can test these 500, then it's a good benchmark for the industry. If these 500 websites are very difficult to test, well, you, God help the rest of you, shall we say. So that really was uh, the reason for choosing these 500. So, okay, so what we did is we used some tools to uh, access these websites, uh, buy to the pages, analyze the web elements in the pages, uh, and not just do it once, but do it repeatedly over time, so we could see how elements changed as people either you know, updated the sites or, or you know, there were dynamic pages that as you reloaded and went through different parts of the site, it was the same page with different data. So you could get a sense of how the page was structured from both a static and a dynamic standpoint. But what did we find? Well, the first thing we found is on a given page, um, the web elements were not meant to be unique. And so if you read the W3 spec of a web page in the HTML spec or the XHTML spec, one of the first things that they say is every ID on the page should be unique. Uh -uh, no, it's not. So that's a big problem. So if you're using a test automation strategy, which relies on finding something on the page where the ID is unique, when you reload the page or when you have the page even open, uh, that's going to fail because we found that the same ID was being reused on the same page at once. Um, and this can happen for a variety of reasons. You have um, a, a web page made up of multiple components, different frameworks. Um, it's easy for the, um, the application to be built from different elements, none of which know about each other. And so they're using IDs that they think are unique. And when you put them all together, they're not unique. But whatever the reasons, ultimately, IDs are not unique. So if, you, if you're using that as your primary strategy for automation, find a button by its ID, it's not going to work. You might get the wrong button. Um, some, the second thing is, even if the IDs um, you know, were, were, were unique or semi-unique, uh, the problem is also the IDs aren't even stable. So one problem is that you've got the ID repeated on the page multiple times. But the next problem is that same ID, when you reload the page, it's different. Um, so you get you know, pages that have static IDs. For example, if you look on the left-hand column, an example of a static ID will be the UW footer contact us. So that's an, a page, it's like a footer element that says contact us. So you want to you know, test that works, you can record that ID. But unfortunately, uh, that ID is the rarity. A lot of the IDs are more like the ones in the middle to the right, where you have like a root part, like CU card group media, which is stable or name, and then there's a number after it. And if you refresh the page or you have multiple elements, they have the same first part and a different last part. And then of course, on the right hand side, you get these just random number letter combinations. It could be an ID from a database, it could be a session ID, it could be a whole bunch of stuff. And those dynamic IDs that are to various things. So you have like fully static IDs that don't change when you refresh the page. You've got the ones in the middle which are changing but have some stable bits and the ones on the right that are just complete gibberish. If you actually look at a given a given page uh, on, the, on, on a website and look at the count, the percentage, there's very few consistent elements across any website. Uh, you know, 19% have an ID called content, 18% have a, an, have a uh, element called footer, main, header. These are, you know, there's maybe eight elements, five, six elements that are going to be stable. So, the, you know, you could find the content, the footer, the main, the header, the main content, the logo. After that, you've got no, almost no chance of finding what's on the page. You might get the FB route, which is, you know, Facebook route, a search box, but that's it. So you're already, after that, you're, you're on your own. There are very few stable elements that have well-defined names on a website these days. So almost everything is either dynamic or semi-dynamic, it seems. So that means that your IDs are very difficult. So the IDs will be non-unique and are likely to change and be unstable. So therefore, if your IDs are not a good thing, let's look at attributes. So attributes, these are things other than the ID, though obviously ID is, is a type of attribute too, but it could be things like the CSS class, it could be the href, it could be the style tags, could be the target, could be the source, could be title, could be uh, you know value rel, it could be some area attributes like you know area role, it could be area title, there's lots of accessibility attributes called area which are recommended to use. But you might be recommended to use them, but look at this list, it's very few websites in that top 500 are actually using it. 
Um, so now that the thing is, the, the ones that you have to use are class, href, because you use them for styling. Even ID is not being used as much because a lot of uh, web pages now are using dynamic frameworks like React. So even the ID tags are not as common as they were maybe a few or four years ago. So the irony is that these new frameworks like React are actually in some ways making things worse because you've now got um, you know frameworks that don't need IDs and other attributes generating large amounts of dynamic elements with very few attributes unless you actually add them. And we'll get back to that in terms of developer things later. But look at that, it's class and href are the biggest. The big problem with class is that class is for style. And one of the best practices you'd want to say is if I'm going to be testing an app that's likely to change, like a web page, someone's going to want to change the color or the look and feel. The one thing that probably is going to change the most frequently will be the style of it, which will be the class. But on the other hand, it's one of the few attributes that's there. So that's one of the quandaries. The attributes that are most stable, the ones that you think would be the best, will be things like the title, which is the tooltip, the uh, things like the rel, maybe the alt tag. These are a role, because they're, they're maybe even name. Those are good attributes because they, they, they describe something in a way that doesn't change. Typically, if a button is going to be you know, creating an account balance, it's going to be, you know, title is the same every time uh, other than the language issue if it's localized whereas you might change the color of that button the position of that button and so the, the one tag that you probably do have in place is class but class tends to be the least stable so in terms of the attributes you can use class href style and target are the four most common target usually doesn't tell you very much just you know this page or, an, or a new page or self the style and the class will vary a lot if you change the look of a field. And href can be quite good, but it is relying then on the URL structure. And if the URL has dynamic elements in it in the query string, even the href can be difficult. So in terms of the attributes we found, there's not a lot of well of highly used attributes that are particularly good for automation. There's a bunch of attributes that are hard to automate, use for automation, and not many other ones being used. Okay. So if we look at an example of this to make it more concrete. Uh, we looked at Microsoft Dynamics Business Central. So this is an example of a business app. So before we were looking at the world's top 500 apps, which are a lot of consumer apps and, you know, and internet facing apps. But if we even look at a business central, which is a more internal you know, B2B application, uh, same problem. Look at the number of attributes on the left on that graph. The distribution, you know, class is everywhere. Uh, there's an area label in this case and title. So those are actually quite good. Control name might be okay, D, whatever that is, and that's pretty much it. So you've got class, which is good, title and area label, which is good, control name, which is good, but even there, I mean, look at the ratio. It's like you know, five, five, six of them are classes and the rest much, much lower. So the problem even in a business application is the same thing. The, number, the only thing that you're gonna have is probably an, an ID in a class, and that might be it. Okay, so the next problem is that, oh, so, okay, IDs are, IDs are uh, not unique, IDs are dynamic, and most other attributes aren't being used except for classes. So what about classes? So if we look at classes, there's a problem with classes. Look at these classes. Uh, this is taken from an application, and uh, I think it's actually from Google Drive in this case. Uh, if you look at Google Drive here, you've got a giant hier hierarchy of nested divs with a bunch of random letter hyphenated joined classes. Class WA hyphen SA hyphen C A I K D A A B Z G. It's dynamically generated by a framework. Obviously, it's probably some folder structure in the drive. You've no idea what that is. I mean, you can automate that, but you've got, there's no way of tying that back to a business test case. Maybe you want to open up the drive folder called uh, My Documents or the shared drive called you know, Legal Documents. There's nothing in here that says that. So the problem is that even when you have attributes that, that do exist like class, they don't have meaningful information to make automation reliable. Um, so that's another problem. So the classes in a lot of apps is, is also auto-generated as well as the IDs. Okay, you think so? We so that's pretty bad, but there's worse. Uh, in addition to having uh, uh, classes that are randomly generated, you also have duplicate classes uh, relying on position. So imagine you've got a menu you click on. This is dynamics again. Pops up a menu. Okay, the menu's got some options. Okay, I'm going to record the clicking on that link in that menu. Lovely. And then when I close the menu and open the menu a second time and play it back. I'm gonna have the same menu again. Oh, actually I'm not. The old menu's still there, it didn't, it didn't destroy itself. It was just left and the new menu is just above it with the higher Z index. I kid you not. So you're gonna have multiple of the exact same things but some are either hidden 
or above each other. And so now when you try and click on a link that you recorded earlier or wrote an automation script for earlier, instead of clicking on the menu that you think you're clicking on, you're clicking on the hidden one or the one that's three layers back that's actually not in use anymore. And then you wonder why your automation script doesn't work. Uh, and if you look here at another example, not just to pick on Microsoft, but at Salesforce, same thing. A lot of the uh, buttons and links and elements are in that light blue color. It means they're actually hidden. So uh, the dark blue items are visible, the light blue elements are hidden. So when you've recorded something on the DOM tree, it's actually now hidden. So again, it makes it difficult to automate when the things you think you've, you, you're actually clicking on or, or typing text into or automating in some way are the elements that used to be there, not the ones that are currently in there. So that's some of the problems we see with automation of web applications. It basically uh, comes down to the fact that and the, old, the, old, the underlying problem really is that it comes down to the fact that web pages are built uh, for the most part using uh, frameworks and text editors and code that generates HTML. Um, whereas if you use things like desktop app and mobile apps, you're using tools like Xcode or you know, like Visual Studio or Eclipse, and you are building an application and it forced you to enable things the right way, it forced you to add text. So when you're doing a lot of the more traditional automation of desktop or mobile apps, the actual IDEs effectively enforced you to actually put in metadata that made testing easier. With web applications, you can code it in a text file, you can use frameworks, and unless you intentionally uh, make it easy for automation, um, it doesn't automatically do that for you. And it certainly doesn't enforce it. The rules that the internet is supposed to work with um, don't, don't aren't, aren't enforced. And the thing is that browsers like Chrome and, and Firefox, because they deal with the real world, they look over these problems. They don't worry about non-duplicate IDs and things. So they make it easy for a manual tester to do testing because they basically ignore the rules and will deal with the world that we live in. As an automation engineer, unfortunately, you don't have that luxury. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Denise to talk about some of the things we can do uh, to make this better. Okay, so I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, probably... I can see your screen, perfect. Oh, I did. It's gone again. And you're on mute. Mute. Okay. Uh, I, I want to share just one window. Uh, share your screen, click to start screen sharing. So. we we'll just do the whole oh, screen. Yeah, now. yeah, it's sharing section. And now I can expand it. Yeah. So I'm I'm close. I'm close. <laughs> uh, this uh, window almost there. It is. Oh. There we yeah. go. I can see it perfect. Yeah. Here we go. So. Uh, Thanks for the excellent introduction, uh, Adam. So we now know the problem, and uh, this is not a, an easy problem to solve, but uh, we'll try to give you some recommendations. Uh, what can we do uh, to make our automated tests more reliable and less uh, flaky? So our first thing, uh, what can we do? And I may say that basically there are two types of applications. So some of them you are developing uh, in, uh, in your organization and uh, you may have access to developers and you may somehow influence uh, uh, them and you may influence development uh, of the application. And if this is the case, then you may talk uh, to developers and collaborate with them and they may do some slight changes uh, that will not cost much for them, but that may do uh, test automation much, much easier uh, and stable. So uh, ideally, uh, there should be tools uh, used together by uh, testers and developers that will help to collaborate uh, and uh, communicate on the topic how to make the application more suitable uh, for uh, 
uh, for testing. But there are also other types of applications if you need to test something developed uh, by uh, another big uh, company. So, for example, if you're using CRM or ERP system like uh, Dynamics systems from Microsoft or Salesforce, so you cannot uh, influence the application itself and you have to work with uh, what you get uh, from those companies. So uh, I know that the Microsoft and Salesforce are uh, definitely testing their uh, solutions, but uh, if you do configuration, if you add some add-ons, plugins to these solutions, then uh, you may need to do testing of the integrated solution. And in this, in this case, uh, we have to test uh, what we get and there is no way to uh, change the application. So, uh, what to do? So, how to solve these uh, problems? So, let's see. Uh, if we are coping with uh, dynamic uh, IDs, then uh, let's uh, actually distinguish two situations. It can be a pure dynamic. In this case, uh, we should just get rid uh, and do not use this uh, attribute uh, in our expat selectors for web elements. But uh, if it is a semi-dynamic ID, like uh, on the second example here, then you may use um, some approach that will uh, use contains function uh, of XPath, and uh, we may search for the first part and for the second part uh, of our ID, and thus exclude uh, this dynamic part. It may be uh, not suitable uh, in all the cases, but sometimes it may really help to find the element uh, on the screen. So if ID uh, is not an option, then it makes really sense to take a look at uh, other attributes. So some of most uh, widely used uh, these days and that may help uh, to find an element are also class and role. And uh, so avoid generated IDs. Uh, if, so here I am giving some um, simple advice how to make your uh, selectors for web elements uh, more reliable and less flaky. So uh, avoid generated IDs so you may easily uh, discover uh, and see that they are dynamic. Uh, avoid the full XPath, so never use XPath that just enumerates all the nodes from the root of the page uh, till the element you are interacting with. So full path is really not an option because uh, if uh, developers do something to the application, to the layout, and this will break uh, your locators. Uh, sometimes you may use uh, an index. So uh, if you have some list, then you may access uh, element, uh, elements of this list by using an index. And in many cases, especially when uh, you have uh, very weak attributes uh, in your application, uh, it makes sense to use the, simply use the text. So many buttons have the text, many uh, edit fields have some placeholders, then uh, you may find uh, those elements by using text function uh, of XPath. So uh, you may also uh, try to build uh, locators using different strategies by using area attributes, by using index, by using some other approaches and uh, choose between them uh, what's best and what works uh, in your case. You may even try to use several locators uh, at once to find your element and uh, this will make uh, element identification more reliable. So example two, so weak attribute usage. Unfortunately, this is the most difficult situation. So if uh, in your application uh, you see the elements like this without uh, any attributes, then uh, the only thing that will probably help you is just using the text. But luckily, uh, there is no many such application, uh, applications these days and uh, developers are moving away uh, from uh, this approach. Uh, so if you have the situation and if you have access to developers, then better talk to them and uh, ask them to 
use at least some attributes that will help you to find uh, the elements. So uh, the problem that Adam already described with the hidden layers. So this is an example when you are navigating through the sequence of forms and uh, the form that you completed and after you uh, proceeded to the next one, the previous form uh, is still in the DOM tree and uh, it is hidden, but all the elements can still be found. And uh, in some cases, in some applications, uh, there may be elements that uh, have, are actually identical and present uh, on different forms. Uh, for example, OK button can be, uh, or next button can be uh, on any form. And when, uh, if your express locator does not take this into account, then uh, things that uh, worked well uh, in one scenario during recording uh, may stop working when you play back uh, your test or when you play uh, a sequence of your tests and uh, the number of these hidden layers grows uh, within the application. So what, what can we do uh, in this case? In this case, uh, it make, uh, makes really sense to um, somehow uh, have your XPath uh, modular. So the first part, part of your XPath should be able to let me return back, able to find the active uh, uh, form uh, here in the DOM tree and only after you find this active form, uh, the second part of the XPath uh, should find the actual element you want to work with. So I will return to this uh, a bit later. So uh, what vendors can do? So we are the vendors of the test automation tool, and we did a lot of things that may uh, help you to analyze your, your application and choose the best strategy uh, for your uh, selectors that will be reliable and less uh, flaky. So let's see uh, what you can do uh, with the tools. So uh, tools can, and our tool rupees uh, can do all of things listed uh, on this page they can uh, help uh, to uh, determine uh, dynamic IDs. Uh, they may help to analyze uh, what attributes are good for finding elements and which are not so good. Uh, analyze classes to see uh, if a class is used just for styling or maybe it has some semantic uh, meaning that uh, helps to distinguish the element uh, from some uh, other ele elements on the page. Uh, and of course, uh, this is the thing I was talking about uh, uh, on the previous slide about uh, hidden layers. So I'll talk about this later in more details. And so the last thing uh, what vendors can do is they can incorporate some kind of artificial intelligence or some clever algorithms that uh, are able to find the element uh, when it is moved or its attributes changed completely. So some magic that uh, will fix the XPath locator and uh, will find the element uh, when the application has uh, changed. So let's talk about all these things uh, in more details. So. Uh, what we have, uh, for example, in rupees is that uh, we have a web spy. And if you will connect with this web spy uh, to uh, a page, then uh, there is a way to weekly uh, get the list of all the names of all the attributes that are used by, uh, by the application. So it may help you to find some suitable attributes that you may use to build your selectors uh, for the elements. Also, uh, there is a way to, uh, so let's return to the previous slide. Also in Rapis, you can also uh, get the list of values for a specific attribute. So for example, uh, if you want to determine uh, if the uh, IDs uh, or in your application are dynamic or not, then uh, you may get the list of all the values for ID attribute on the page. And uh, just by looking at it, you may find out uh, if it is dynamic or semi-dynamic or it is a static. Uh, 
can be used uh, as it is. So the next thing is uh, using rupees, uh, you may uh, save uh, snapshots, DOM snapshots uh, of your pages, and you may then load the snapshots uh, uh, into a web spy. So for example, you may have uh, a few snapshots of the same page, and you may do testing of your expat expressions and search for elements in all the snapshots that are open here. This thing also helps to find uh, dynamic things and see uh, what are the differences uh, between different versions uh, of the same page. So what, what frequently happens is when you record, you build your selector, uh, it works on the page, but when you reload the page, you uh, run your test and the selector doesn't work. So you may save uh, snapshots of this page, uh, try your uh, selector and quickly find out dynamic uh, uh, attributes and what prevents uh, this selector from working uh, properly. Okay, uh, the next thing is, uh, uh, there is a way, uh, and we um, try this approach internally, uh, to see what attributes are actually meaningful uh, for the application and what attributes uh, are not meaningful. So uh, we did an experiment and uh, we used the results of this experiment to build uh, the default uh, configuration for our recorder uh, in rupees. And, uh, uh, in this experiment, uh, we uh, try to analyze the DOM snapshots of uh, all the most 500 uh, websites, uh, so mainly uh, the home pages. And what we did is that uh, we built um, uh, selectors for elements uh, using a specific attribute, and then we uh, saw uh, we tried to calculate how many of those selectors will stay valid if we will uh, remove this attribute uh, from the selector. And uh, this way uh, we try to figure out uh, what the attributes are really important. And so here is what we actually uh, found out. So the class attribute is the very important and if it is used for uh, semantics, then uh, it may really uh, help to find the element. So there are other attributes, very good attributes like area label. So D attribute here, I think it's a false positive because uh, this is, uh, as far as I remember, it's part of uh, SVG markup inside, inside the web page. So let's see next. So anchors, so by anchors we call, uh, this thing. So sometimes to find the element, it may first uh, make sense to find the um, container of this element and only after that uh, find the element within this container. So for example, this approach with anchors uh, helps to um, cope with this hidden uh, layer problem. So uh, with all that said uh, about dynamic attributes, uh, attributes, classes, anchors, and all these things, uh, uh, we came up with the approach when uh, using rupees, you may define a recorder configuration and uh, define what attributes to use during recording, what attribute values to exclude during recording. So for example, if it is a dynamic ID, let's do not use it if it contains just digits. And if there are classes that uh, are meaningful for the identification, we may also list them here. We may define anchors that uh, show us where we may find the containers and those anchors are automatically uh, appended uh, to uh, selectors uh, during recording. So if an element is within this container, then uh, Rupees will use this prefix for the XPath, uh, calculate the relative XPath uh, within this container and will append it uh, 
uh, to the expat. And, and Dennis, Dennis, yeah, and this is the profile you would do for each application you have. So if you were testing four or five different apps, you would use a profile for each app. There will be a representation yeah, we, of that app. Yeah, yeah, we, we have the profile uh, that we've built after we analyzed uh, uh, most 500 uh, applications. So the profile that on average will suit uh, in most of, uh, can be used in most of the cases. But, uh, <clears throat> sorry. But uh, if your application is a complex one and the default configuration doesn't work for you, then you may use all these analysis tools built into rupees and, <coughs> and uh, change this uh, default recorder configuration and uh, make the recording more reliable uh, and effective. So, uh, and also there is an alternative way. So instead of configuring the recorder, we may have the tool uh, try to find the most suitable element uh, on the page. So if the page is not found during uh, using expat uh, selector, then uh, in repeats, for example, we have self healing locators that are trying to find the element that probably uh, should be used in the case. So Rupees analyzes all the elements on the page. And um, so since during recording, uh, it remembers uh, as much as possible uh, additional information about the element, then when expert doesn't work, then Rupees tries to analyze the elements on the page and find the one which resembles uh, the element that we need uh, in the, uh, mostly. So, and uh, when you run uh, a web test with a self-healing locator, then you will see uh, this picture. So you will see that uh, some element was found. Uh, there is some <coughs> uh, confidence uh, with which we think it's the right element. We may see some differences between attributes. So what has changed since the time when we recorded uh, the script, we can see the screenshot of the element uh, from the recording session and from the playback session. And uh, Rupees will display you this uh, prompt and it will say you that some object uh, were uh, relearned during execution. So we had to rebuild their expert selectors by finding uh, objects that resembles the objects that we need uh, mostly. And uh, do you wish to update uh, your test objects? <clears throat> so you may uh, update uh, your test automatically. If you see by looking uh, at the report, if you see that elements that were found are really the elements that uh, the test uh, needed during playback, then you may automatically up update uh, selectors for these uh, elements, or you may say no and do this update uh, manually. Because sometimes uh, the uh, element that was found with this automatic uh, self-healing procedure may be the wrong one. And uh, here is our experience. So we used uh, both ways uh, by uh, configuring the recorder or by using uh, self-healing uh, locators. So I may say that if we put some parallels with the uh, modern uh, days, then uh, <laughs> self-healing or uh, manual maintenance of tests uh, is the cure. So, because, so you have your tests uh, broken and you need to somehow repair them, but uh, if you will spend some time and analyze your application, find what attributes not to use, what attributes are good to use for element identification, we'll def find the classes that are good to find elements, we'll uh, define the anchors for such cases like hidden layers, then uh, with this configuration, the selectors that uh, will be recorded uh, by the tool, uh, will be from the beginning uh, resilient and more stable and will continue to work uh, after some slight 
up, application update. So recorder configuration uh, in this case is a vaccine. So you prevent uh, some bad things uh, from uh, happening. So we are close to the uh, end of this presentation. So what we may say, um, so analyzing the MOS 500, uh, this analysis shows uh, the scale of the problem. So we see that uh, some default assumptions uh, do not work uh, in many cases, and this is why we need to be prepared. So and uh, current technology may help us to uh, analyze the application and uh, define uh, web recorder configuration. Uh, future, probably, so we hope for this, uh, and there are a lot of starts, startups uh, in this field. Uh, maybe will uh, some sophisticated algorithms appear that will be able to find the elements by some very simple description. Because it's not a problem for human to find the OK button, but uh, for automated tool that is using XPath like Ether, it may be a problem uh, if there are some changes uh, to the application. But uh, future AI, uh, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's a distant future. Uh, and what we uh, have to use right now uh, is a recorder and configuration. So it gives the best uh, and uh, stable results. Mm -hmm. So it's, ba it's basically computer-assisted automation rather than computer doing the automation as magic. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it's interesting, one of the things I remember Denise, you and I were saying is that when you look at manual testers, you ask a human to test an application that a human's going to be using. When we, when we have automation engineers, and they're, like, they're using like Selenium and Java, they have to basically become robots. You're turning a human into a robot. Um, it's just sort of funny to watch. I think that's it. So. Thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar today. We will, as I mentioned, be putting a copy on our YouTube channel. There'll be a recap on our on our website. Um, before we leave, one last quick uh, plug I'd like to do is we will be discussing these and other topics at Inflectricon 2022. So hopefully, as things improve around the United States and around the world, we are having an imperfect. Uh, so we're having a, an in-person conference in May 5th and 6th in the Washington, D.C. area. Tickets are available. Early bird pricing is available right now. Uh, if, if you want to come, bring your team, come yourself. We've got lots of speakers, and we'll be talking about automation, testing, performance, security, uh, agile, DevOps, AI, lots of other good stuff as well. So feel free to look for tickets on our website. Uh, so with that, have a great rest of the day, morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And thanks, Denise, and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar.